world, Jim Rickers. How are you? Where, where am I catching you today, Jim? Uh, I'm upstate, uh, up in New England, up in the mountains, uh, in my one of my studios, and uh, it's very, uh, it's great to be with you, Lior. Um, listen, Jim, I want to get started with, you know, with with what's working in today's market. Um, what are some of the most attractive assets for 2017? Well, you know, Leo, the way I uh, think about it, I have what I call a, a permanent portfolio, which is uh, just a way to allocate wealth. It's what I do uh, with my own money, and I recommend it to investors. Uh, that is robust to uh, just about everything that could happen. I, I'm more of a global macro strategist. I'm not a stock picker. I don't uh, recommend you know buy this sector or that sector uh, in particular. But my permanent portfolio would have um, basically it would, it would be allocations of your investable assets. Now I should define that term. First of all, investable assets is, is the amount of money or savings that you have to invest, not including your home equity and your business equity. I don't think people should treat their homes as uh, a portfolio investment. I know a lot of people do. It's a big expenditure, but it's not something you really want to uh, gamble with or take chances with or over leverage. Uh, same thing with your business equity. If you're, you know, you're a dry cleaner, car dealer, doctor, lawyer, dentist, uh, you run a pizza parlor, restaurant, whatever, uh, that's your livelihood. So you don't want to uh, really speculate with that. So take your home equity and your business equity, put it off to one side, whatever's left over, those are your investable assets. I recommend 10% of that uh, in physical gold uh, or silver. I think silver uh, also performs very much the same function, not 50%, not 100%. You know, you shouldn't go all in on any asset category, but I think uh, 10% is the right amount. Um, I expect a gold to go up uh, by a factor of you know perhaps five to ten um, in a matter of years. I mean, not talking about twenty years, and talking two to three years in in the next global financial panic. That's something I talk about in my books. Uh, uh, my most recent book, The Road to Ruin, and also uh, just coming out this week is the paperback addiction, uh, edition of uh, uh, The Death of Money. is a 2014 book. It's just coming out in paperback now with new material. So I talk about I talk about this uh, in uh, in those books, and the point I make is. Is that um, if if nothing bad happens, and let's hope for that, uh, you know, you won't get hurt with a 10% allocation. But if a lot of these other asset categories collapse, that 10% gold and silver is your insurance. I also recommend cash, a large allocation of cash, maybe 30%. People are surprised to hear me say that. They go, "Wait a second, Jim, you're the guy talking about the death of money. Why would I have cash?" Uh, the answer is uh, the answer is I might not have it forever or for very long. But in the short run, um, it is, uh, it's kind of an underrated asset. It doesn't have a very high yield. I understand that, but, uh, it has a lot of embedded optionality. If things start to fall apart in other categories, the person with cash is able to kind of come in, pivot, uh, with better information into something that's doing well or pick up bargains if some other sector has fallen out of bed. I also, um, I recommend private equity, um, art, fine art. Uh, land, real estate. I think these are all assets that, um, in, in various ways will hold up to inflation or deflation. And that's an important point because we could have either one. Uh, the stage is set for either one. There are certainly forces in place pushing in both directions. Uh, you know, if you definitely knew inflation was coming, investing would be easy. You'd go buy gold, silver, land, you'd leverage it up. That's easy. If you definitely knew deflation was coming, uh, you'd have cash, you'd have 10-year treasury notes and some other assets that are robust to de deflation. But what if I said we're right on the knife edge? It could tip either way, which I think is uh, the best way to describe the system. So you would want some of both. I call this the, the barbell approach where you have inflation hedges like gold, silver, and land. You have deflation hedges like 10-year treasury notes. And then connecting the two ends of the barbell, you have cash, which gives you um, a lot of embedded optionality. That's a, that's a great point. And, and, and uh, it's an all-around, like a four-season portfolio. Um, I, I want to ask you a few things about it. Um, private equity. The thing I love about that, uh, collectibles, uh, art, obviously collectibles have been one of the best performing uh, um, assets of, of the last five, six years. I mean, uh, you talk about like Ferraris and, and Lamborghinis from the 15th to 60s, they've gone up in, to insane valuations. Um, and what I also like about that, all of these and real estate is it's off Wall Street. It, it doesn't matter what the financial sector is doing. 
Uh, these these are uh, uncorrelated assets. Is that is that part of the reason why you you like private equity? Follow following that question regarding cash, thirty percent. The reason that you're feeling comfortable with this is because you don't expect something that is going to crater the entire plan overnight. People are going to have time to prepare. If they see inflation start creeping up, they can unload some of that cash into other uh, sort of assets. And just to clarify, when you say factor of 5 to 10 in gold, you mean 500 to 1,000 percent, correct? That's correct. Uh, so I've got gold going to um, uh, well, my tar- intermediate target price is ten thousand dollars an ounce. That's not a number uh, you know that I made up or I pull out of a hat or I uh, mentioned just to get uh, publicity or uh, attract attention. It's actually um, the result of a, a careful study of the implied non-deflationary price of gold uh, in a financial panic. If you had a financial crisis worse than 2008, which is what I expect. I think you can see that coming based on the, the system dynamics, the scale of the system, the concentration of banking assets, the amount of derivatives, the interconnectedness of the system. There, there are lots and lots of reasons, and I discuss all this in detail in my book, why the, ne- why the next financial crisis will be worse than 2008. So if, if something like that comes along, uh, you're going to need a solution. You're going to need a way to uh, both restore confidence and reliquify the world. Now, we're at the point where central banks are tapped out. I mean, they, they took their balance sheets. I'll use the Federal Reserve as an example. They took their balance sheet from $800 billion to over $4 trillion to deal with the last crisis, but they have not normalized it. They haven't gone back down to $800 billion or even a trillion since the crisis is over. What's, what's still, the risk in that? What is the risk for well, them to have such well, a large uh, portfolio? Well, one risk is that um, if you have another crisis tomorrow, what are you going to do? I mean, you're going to double it again to eight trillion, twelve trillion. Where's the where's the confidence boundary? I mean, legally you could, um, and a lot of modern uh, modern monetary theorists, MMT people, uh, you know, Professor Stephanie Kelton, Paul McCulley, and others think that that's exactly what you would do. You would just print more money and take the balance sheet to eight trillion or twelve trillion. I don't think that will work. I think that there's some uh, the you can't specify the exact number, but there's some confidence boundary where people just say, you know what, I'm out of here. I, this system's crazy. I don't, I don't believe you can keep printing. I want to dump my dollars and get into some of these other hard assets. So that's where the price would begin to spike. But there is one other source of liquidity in the world, potentially, which is the special drawing right. That's world money uh, printed by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Um, it sounds kind of geeky and complicated. That's partly by design because they don't want people to understand it. But simply put, you know, the Federal Reserve can print dollars. The European Central Bank can print euros. Well, the IMF has a printing press. They can print these SDRs. Uh, but unlike the other central banks I mentioned, they're not highly leveraged. The uh, IMF is only leveraged about three to one. The, the Federal Reserve is leveraged 113 to one. So uh, they're kind of tapped out. But the, I, I'm, but the IMF could issue uh, trillions of SDRs to provide the liquidity to kind of bring the system back from the brink of panic. But, of course, that would be highly inflationary, and that's when the price of gold would, would skyrocket. The other alternative to SDRs is gold itself. You could use gold um, either as a strict gold standard or some kind of reference for money supply to restore confidence. That might work, but then you have to wrestle with the price. People say, you know, there's not enough gold for a gold standard. Well, that's nonsense. There's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. I mean, $1,250 an ounce. No, the, uh, the, the existing amount of gold um, if you try to base a money supply on that, it w- you'd have to reduce the money supply. It would be highly deflationary. But if you took the price of gold to $10,000 an ounce, and again, I've done the math on this. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, that would be um, that would be the right price to support the money supply with 40% gold backing. So, so these things are feasible, but they all point in one of several directions. Either you use the SDR solution, which is inflationary, or you raise the price of gold, which is inflationary, uh, or you just spend a lot of dollars. They, they all end up... Uh, basically uh, creating inflation just in three different directions. So that's why you want gold um, as your insurance. But it, w- it won't happen overnight. I mean, the, the crisis could come up very quickly. I do caution people that they should get their gold now, not just because the, the price is attractive, but because you can get it. Uh, it. It's available. If you wait for the panic, I, I think there will be signs of this coming. I'm, I agree that it won't happen in, in one day. There may be an acute phase that happens in, in a matter of just a few days, but you'll see it coming, as was the case in 2007. I mean, I was warning about 
the uh, the financial panic of 2007, 2008, you know, years before. And then even in 2007, I could see it was going to get a lot worse. So so you can see these things coming. But most people, you know, they're kind of in denial about it. They don't want to really hear about it. They wait until things do get out of control. But you'll find the next time that you actually won't be able to get the gold. It won't be a matter of price. The, the price will be going up. You'll see you'll, You'll see it on the internet or on TV or on CNBC, and it's going up, you know, a couple hundred dollars per ounce per day. Um, you'll say, oh, gee, I better go get some gold. But you'll find that you won't be able to get it. The dealers will be sold out. The mint will be back ordered. So the time to get that is now. Um, now, Leo, on your your earlier point uh, about the private equity and collectibles, I mean, those are two separate asset classes. When I say private equity, I'm talking about investing in companies, but not listed companies, not companies on the New York Stock Exchange or, or the Nasdaq, but you know, startup companies technology companies, natural resource companies, created by entrepreneurs where um, you can know the person you're investing with. It, it's still a form of investing. You're, you're buying stock, but you're not relying on a stock exchange or an index uh, or a broker for your liquidity. It's really just a contract between you and the entrepreneur starting the company. I think there are some attractive opportunities there. A little bit hard to identify, but uh, the other one is fine. I'm not a, necessarily a big fan of what people call collectibles, whether it's wine or Lamborghinis. Uh, fine art, yes, uh, but that, that's because fine art has a very, very long track record, really thousands of years, uh, as being a very good store of wealth. Um, the pro- the problem with the you know Lamborghini, uh, it might go up, the dollar price might go up, but it's not liquid. I mean, <clears throat> try selling it in a in a panic, you won't be able to, uh, or how it will preserve wealth uh, through through thick and thin. So the model portfolio is really gold, silver, land cash, fine art, and private equity. I'm not saying don't have anything in the stock market, but I would keep that allocation relatively modest. And and most of all, be nimble, stay informed. I mean, this is not, none of these things are set it and forget it portfolios. They're a good place to start, but you, uh, you know, things are changing daily. I think the fact that uh, Trump's election as president is a very significant change in the financial landscape in terms of potential response functions to future panics. So uh, you need to, uh, as I say, stay alert and stay nimble. Um, let, let's break down the biggest risks for the average person. Let, let's separate the, the question into four groups. The retirees, the people that are working but don't have, but have insufficient savings right now. Um, and then gr- the third group would be basically people that have, uh, that are working and they're in peak earning years, so 35 to 55, 65, and they have market uh, they have money working in the markets, They're, they have allocations. And the fourth group would be the millennial generation just starting out, getting out of college. Um, what would be the risks to these uh, four groups separately? What, and, and, and more important than risks for, for listeners, uh, what are some of the solutions that you're uh, you know, suggesting for people who are retiring right now, for people who are in low paying jobs and, and just don't have uh, you know, a lot of savings? And then uh, people that are uh, that they do have money but are afraid to, um, to to risk it or lose it, and then the millennial the millennials that the, that are now you know they're experiencing this this new populist uh, president not just in the U.S. but Europe is spreading to be more and more populist, and jobs are changing uh, like never before. I mean, uh, latest statistics are six jobs, six careers by the time you're 44. You're going to change six careers. It's, it's, it's almost insane. So uh, what are some of the risks and solutions you see for these uh, four groups? Well, the easiest group to deal with, the one with the least risk, is the group that has no savings. Uh, and that's because, as Bob Dylan said, if you ain't got nothing, you got nothing to lose. In other words, they're not going to lose in a market crash um, because they don't have any uh, significant amount of stocks or bonds or savings. So it's not good that they don't have savings, but uh, they're insulated because they're they're not exposed to the markets that are likely to crash. For that group, uh, the biggest risk is inflation, uh, which is to say, you know, you're you have a paycheck, uh, you're living. You know, week to week, uh, you get your pay, you pay your bills, whether it's mortgage or rent, and buy groceries, you don't have a lot left over and you don't have a lot in the bank. So you're not going to get hurt by a stock market crash because you don't have anything in the stock market, but you could get hurt by inflation. Um, and for that individual, I would say um, to the extent they have any savings at all, you might want to put a little something in, into gold and silver. You know, I, I uh, was in, in Las Vegas not long ago and I was in a taxi. I was there to speak at an investment conference and, you know, struck up a conversation 
conversation with the taxi driver and um you know i, I said i was speaking at a conference and so she we kind of got on the, the subject of, of financial advice and i was saying well you know if you have a if you have a hundred thousand dollars put ten thousand dollars into gold or silver and she just cut me off she said look all i have is ten thousand dollars that's all i have to my name and uh i said well look just go buy one gold coin you know at the time gold was about thirteen hundred dollars an ounce so that was uh you know a little more than ten percent that'd be thirteen percent of her savings but so just buy one gold coin put it in a safe place and that's your insurance against inflation that's your insurance against you know things like the banks closing or or extreme financial risk so uh, even for people of modest means uh you know some gold or silver does have a place um now for all the other groups you mentioned uh you know Leo you said they're in they're, they're in different demographic brackets some are already retired some are kind of mid career late career and then the mid- millennials are, are earlier in the career i would say they all face exactly the same risk which is a systemic collapse. Look, if if systemic collapse doesn't happen and life just goes on and you have normal business cycles, then all the financial advice you hear on TV and and elsewhere is you know pretty much correct. You know the the thing they recommend is um, when you start out younger, have more in the stock market, and as you get older, shift from stocks to bonds because you want to take less risk. You want more certainty as to uh, your income, and uh, you know people say, well, if the stock market goes down 30 percent, nobody thinks that's good. Uh, it's clearly it's bad, but but if you're young enough, they say, well, it'll come back. You know, look, the stock market uh, crashed in 2008, uh, was down 50 percent or more. But it's back to those old levels and even higher today. So for someone who didn't panic, didn't sell, held their stocks in 2008, uh, they've made all that money back and then some uh, in the meantime. So that's the conventional wisdom. That's what your wealth managers tell you. That's what your your robo-advisors tell you. They're actually programming robots to dispense this advice, all based on these um, uh, the, the simple formulas that I'm describing. What I'm saying is completely different. I'm saying, no, we're, we're in a different world. We're in a world where the systemic risk has never been greater. Uh, the next financial crisis will be unprecedented in its magnitude. The capacity of central banks to deal with it is diminished, if not uh, completely gone, because they've wasted uh, so many um, so many of the resources and credibility dealing with the past crisis and haven't normalized things. Uh, and that uh, we're, we're looking at an extinction level event in the next financial crisis. And to back that up again, when I say things like that, people you know, some people kind of roll their eyes and go, "We're well, just a doom and gloom." Uh, no, I mean this is all science and and it's all documented. Uh, in my book, The Road to Ruin, for example, um, that's the book that came out in November two thousand. Uh, 16. I take the readers through two prior crises, uh, real events, 1998 and 2008. Uh, I make the point that in both cases, we were just hours or days away from the complete collapse of the entire financial system. In 1998, I actually negotiated the bailout. That was a a hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management. I negotiated that bailout with uh, the Wall Street banks and with government officials, Federal Reserve and Treasury. So I had a front row seat on that one in 2008. Again, followed that uh, very closely. But, But here's the point, Lior. In 1998, Wall Street bailed out a hedge fund to save the system. In 2008, the central banks bailed out Wall Street to save the system. In the next crisis, 2018, if not sooner, who's going to bail out the central banks? In other words, each crisis gets bigger than the one before. Each bailout gets bigger than the one before. The risks get greater than were the time before. We're now at the point where the central banks won't be able to bail us out because they haven't normalized since the last time. So who's going to bail out the central banks? Well, there's only one clean balance sheet left. Left, which is the SDR, but the, again, the minute you talk about special drawing rights or gold or um, what I describe as the ice nine solution, where, where you actually shut down the system, you money market funds suspend redemptions, you close the stock market, you close the banks to buy time to come up with these solutions, which I think is uh, the most likely outcome, at least as a short run solution. These are, uh, we're uh, looking at the greatest financial catastrophe ever. We're outside here history and experience. We are outside the capacity of central banks to deal with it. So in these extreme outcomes, it doesn't matter if you're 75, 55, or 25, uh, all of your normal financial assets are going to be either wiped out or suspended uh, or reneged or inflated away. And if you don't have some of you know the big three, which would be you know uh, precious metals, art, or land, um, you're going to be wiped out. So, so I think all those groups are facing the same risk from this, uh, you know, what I call extinction level uh, event or threat to capital markets. Okay, well, uh, uh, with regards to what you're saying about central banks being out of tools and out of options, 
Uh, Ray Dalio, the world's largest hedge fund manager by far, recently in front of central bankers and other top commercial bankers uh, where he was invited to speak in New York, he told him, look, I've actually calculated how many months the system has left with with uh, with what you're pursuing here, with the debt levels that you're accumulating uh, on the government side. And uh, when this debt load becomes too excessive, he said that he expect he expects direct injections to bypass the financial sector and basically reach citizens to encourage them to spend as their next uh, phase. He said this was a phase before helicopter money, but he said populism and the impatience of people in the middle and in the lower classes is becoming uh, apparent. It's it's uh, you know it's now inside of the political system. They are looking for solutions. And therefore, he sees these types of, uh, of direct injections, which, which lawfully, he said, there, there are many ways to do it. Um, he says this is the next step. How deep in the demise of this current system are we that we're talking about this? And do you think this is something that's plausible? Obviously, uh, we're talking about one of the most uh, uh, you know, vetted people in, in, in the financial sector ever. Well, I, yeah, I know, uh, I met Ray and, uh, I follow his work in, uh, actually my, my first book, uh, Currency Wars, uh, was one that he selected. You know, each year there's a kind of entry level group coming into, uh, uh, Bridgewater, which is the name of his, um, his hedge fund. Uh, and it's, you know, it's a very interesting place a very strong uh, culture and it's not to everyone's taste but one of the things where he does he picks two or three books a year and 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 encourages his um actually requires his uh, entry-level employees to read them uh and in uh, 2012 uh, he, he picked my book currency war so um i guess he, that was uh, one that had some impact on him but we'll see what he's talking about we're talking about slightly different things they are related uh, the short answer to your question is we are very deep into a process by which the system will collapse so very little doubt about that and again uh, this, these are not just claims there's there's a lot of math and science to back it up having to do with scaling metrics and uh, again I talk about all that in my books I'm, I'm talking about the response function so I'm saying okay so the crash is here what is the reaction function how do governments react what can they do that's when I get into gold and SDRs and the things we just talked about what Ray is saying is well can you head it off are there things you can do today to keep the system from collapsing, he's, he's also looking at a different kind of collapse, a little more political than economic. He's talking about, you know, the rise of populism, and he looks at um, the populist regimes in the past. You know, whether it's Juan Perón in Argentina, uh, Adolf Hitler, uh, Benito Mussolini, um, and, and others. Um, and what he's saying is, in effect, in almost classic Keynesian terms, you've got to stimulate aggregate demand. We've got two percent growth. We seem to be stuck there. Uh, it's no, no surprise. Uh, growth is nothing more than the uh, the sum of uh, you know increases in the working force times productivity. Right. So how many people are working? How productive are they? That's all there is. Um, and so one's growing about one percent. The other one's growing about one one and a half percent. You multiply them together, you end up with this kind of one to two percent growth that we've seen since the end of two thousand eight. Um, and how do we get? But the problem is our debt. Is going up three three and a half percent a year. So if your growth is going up one two percent, and your debt is growing up is going up three and a half four percent, and about to get worse, and you compound both of those things, you can see the debt crisis coming. So that's that's the basis for for Dali's forecast. So what he's saying uh, is, you know, get the get the debt under control if you can, but if you can't, you got to get the growth up. Uh, and what he's saying is, you can either use helicopter money. Or the other thing that's in the air is called the uh, the GBI or Guaranteed Basic Income. This is basically giving people money whether they work or not. Just government saying, hey, here's some money. And I'm not talking about welfare or food stamps. We're actually talking about substantial amounts of money, meaning you know, maybe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a year uh, to people without jobs or who are, who are not making that much money. Or maybe just give it to everybody. Even if you are making money, you get this uh, Guaranteed Basic Income. And that's what he means by direct injections and the idea is that people will go out and spend it and that'll increase aggregate demand there'll be a multiplier we'll get a, you know at least nominal growth if not real growth going and that's one way to deal with the debt crisis what's interesting about that is i hear that from the left and the right you hear it from 
uh, people on the right like Charles Murray um, from Washington Think Tank, very well-known author, uh, public intellectual. And you hear it on the left from people like uh, Bernie Sanders and others. I would I would put Ray Dalio. I, I don't think of him as left or right. He's a bit of an analyst and iconoclast. But um, so let's just say we're hearing it from left, right, and center. So this is definitely one of these things that that's coming. I mean, Joseph Schumpeter talked about it uh, 50 years ago, writing in the uh, more than 50 years ago, writing in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, he thought this was where society was going, and but he's, he predicted it 50 years in the future. He he said. Uh, he said in the 1940s that we would be socialist by the year 2000. I think we are socialists. We just don't realize it. Um, but this is sort of the ultimate um, realization of that. So, so I don't disagree with Ray's analysis, but we're looking at slightly different things. He's saying, how can we head off a crisis? And his answer is, let's increase aggregate demand by giving away money. What I'm saying is we're not going to be able to head off the crisis. It's going to happen and how do we survive it? My answer is have some physical gold and silver. Thoughts on cryptocurrencies, Jim? Um, yeah, I watch them. I, I look at the technology. I've, I've been uh, uh, engaged with the um, United States, United States uh, Special Operations Command at, at, down in uh, Tampa uh, um, to, uh, to uh, kind of interdict uh, ISIS using cryptocurrencies to finance um, the Islamic State. So uh, I'm pretty familiar with it. Uh, I separate the technology and the currencies. I think the um, blockchain technology has a future. In fact, it's already being uh, rolled out and implemented in, in a number of platforms led by uh, J.P. Morgan. There's another new company, uh, uh, Blythe Masters is involved with former head of commodities trading for J.P. Morgan. Uh, the Winklevoss uh, twins are involved. Uh, Mark Andreessen, one of the savviest venture capital investors, startup investors, is involved. So a lot going on with blockchain technology. Bitcoin uses the blockchain, but it's a separate currency. So I'm, uh, I think I'm bullish on the future of blockchain, but not as um, enthusiastic about Bitcoin. At least I don't recommend it for, for portfolios. What I would say there is that the problem with Bitcoin, it was invented in 2009. Uh, and so we haven't seen how it performs through a business cycle yet. Uh, we've had nothing but global expansion since Bitcoin was invented. Now, it's been a weak expansion, uh, but an expansion nonetheless. So Bitcoin has never gone through a business cycle. Bitcoin has never gone through a recession or a depression or a financial panic. So I think it's untested as far as that's concerned. So I think uh, blockchain technology has a future, but uh, cryptocurrencies, I'm, I'm more in a wait and see mode. Now, okay, I, I get that. I, I want to ask you this. Do you, do you feel that, you know, in, in my life I've been part of... Uh, a few wars uh, just because of where I uh, I grew up, etc. Do you think there's a real chance that these currency wars will escalate into physical conflicts? Well, they already are. Um, I would I would say the answer is yes. I mean, the, the the history is the currency wars turned into trade wars, and then when things get bad enough, trade wars turned into shooting wars. That was the exact history of uh, the period from you know 1929 to uh, to 1939 and then on into uh, World War II through 1945 so that's that's exactly what happened there uh, but what's what's new is that we're seeing financial warfare not as the result of uh, other um, economic developments, but as a, as a, a means of attack, as a kind of a first line uh, way of attacking your enemies. I think the financial wars are front and center. It's going on. We have several financial wars going on right now uh, between the United States and Russia. This is uh, after Russia uh, annexed Crimea in 2014 and uh, incurred. Uh, there were incursions in eastern Ukraine, which are ongoing. The U.S. did not want to strike back kinetically. Nobody thought it was a good idea to drop the 82nd Airborne into Sevastopol. So instead, we responded with economic sanctions. Uh, Vladimir Putin correctly understood that as an act of war um, and has responded with cyber financial attacks on the U.S. These are now escalating. Uh, looks like North Korea was behind the um, diversion of $81 million of the reserve positions of Bangladesh uh, held on account of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Uh, we're seeing uh, um, uh, new uh, uh, cyber uh, financial sanctions being posted on Iran. Iran at one point was kicked out of SWIFT. SWIFT is the 
um, uh, it's based in uh, in Belgium. It's the kind of the uh, central nervous system of the global financial system. It's the message traffic system for for almost all major uh, financial money movements in the world. Uh, we actually kicked Iran out of that. That's like cutting off the oxygen supply to a patient in intensive care. Um, just the other day, North Korea was kicked out. Uh, threats to um, kick out uh, non or, or banks elsewhere that do business with North Korea. So we're seeing financial cyber warfare all over the place. So it's not, I would say it's not coming. I would say it's already here. Understood. Jim, th- thanks very much for taking the time and sharing you know, with us some of this important political and, and, and financial point of views and practical advice. I, I personally bought and sent uh, your latest book as a gift to a good friend of mine who's now 18 and I wanted to uh, to get him off to a great start in, in life and make him more knowledgeable. Could you tell folks where to find you know, your work, your books, um, you know, just so people can, can plug in and go there? Uh, thank you. My uh, the, the latest release, uh, the book is called The Death of Money. This book actually came out in 2014, but it's out in a new paperback edition with new material uh, out uh, this week. So that's available on Amazon. But, but all the books are available on Amazon uh, or Barnes & Noble online or your independent bookseller. So it's uh, uh, Currency Wars, um, The Death of Money. Uh, the New Case for Gold and The Road to Ruin. So those are my four books and also my website, jamesrickardsproject.com and very active on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter feed is at James G. Rickards uh, and I put out a lot of financial information there as well. Chip, thank you very much. Thank you. Jim Rickards is regarded as one of the top commentators on the fiat monetary system, mainly because he has studied it as much as anybody else. We began the interview uh, by creating an asset allocation model, which can tackle any economic condition we end up facing, inflation or deflation. At wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash 2017, I created an exclusive report with my personal diversification and portfolio for 2017. Download it so you can gather ideas um, for your own portfolio. Regarding immediate risks, James sees total systematic collapse as an inevitable outcome to these uh, excessive government debt levels and makes the case for gold and real estate. We just created a really juicy special report on these subjects of of risks and safe havens and, and a unique real estate strategy that my partners and I personally used to, to generate three to five thousand dollars on average per deal using none of our own money uh, with the average deal taking about three four weeks between 2009 and 2013 which I think will be very beneficial for for you to learn and utilize in your backyard market wherever you live this is a recession proof strategy I urge you to take some action in your life because no one will do it for you Uh, download our our, our important publications at wealthresearchgroup.com forward slash safe havens for a combination of a, of a myriad of safe uh, The Federal Reserve has leveraged 113 to 1, so uh, they're kind of tapped out, but the, I, I'm, but the IMF could issue uh, trillions of SDRs to provide the liquidity to kind of bring the system back from the brink of panic, but of course that would be highly inflationary, and that's when the price of gold would, would skyrocket. The other alternative to SDRs is gold itself. You could use gold um, either as a strict gold standard or some kind of reference for money supply to restore confidence. That might work, but then you have to wrestle with the price. People say, you know, there's not enough gold for a gold standard. Well, that's nonsense. There's always enough gold. It's just a question of price. I mean, $1,250 an ounce. No, the, uh, the, the existing amount of gold um, if you try to base a money supply on that, it w- you'd have to reduce the money supply. It would be highly deflationary. But if you took the price of gold to $10,000 an ounce, and again, I've done the math on this. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, that would be um, that would be the right price to support the money supply with 40% gold backing. So, so these things are feasible, but they all point in one of several directions. Either you use the SDR solution, which is inflationary, or you raise the price of gold, which is inflationary, uh, or you just spend a lot of dollars. They, they all end up... Uh, basically uh, creating inflation just in three different directions. So that's why you want gold um, as your insurance. But it, w- it won't happen overnight. I mean, the, the crisis could come up very quickly. I do caution people that they should get their gold now, not just because the, the price is attractive, but because 
you can get it. Uh, it it's available. If you wait for the panic, uh, I think there will be signs of this coming. I'm, I agree that it won't happen in, in one day. There may be an acute phase that happens in, in a matter of just a few days, but you'll see it coming, as was the case in 2007. I mean, I was warning about the uh, the financial panic of 2007, 2008, you know, years before, and then even in 2007, I could see it was going to get a lot worse. So, so you can see these things coming, but most people, you know, they're kind of in denial about it. They don't want to really hear about it. They wait until things do get out of control. But you'll find the next time that you actually won't be able to get the gold. It won't be a matter of price. The the price will be going up. You'll you'll, you'll see it on the internet or on TV or on CNBC, and it's going up. You know, a couple hundred dollars per ounce per day. Uh, and you'll say, oh gee, I better go get some gold. But you'll find that you won't be able to get it. The dealers will be sold out. The mint will be back ordered. So the time to get that is now. Um, now, Leo, on your your earlier point uh, about the private equity and collectibles. I mean, those are two separate asset classes. When I say private equity, I'm talking about investing allocation to cash, maybe 30%. People are surprised to hear me say that. They go, wait a second, Jim, you're the guy talking about the death of money. Why would I have cash? Uh, the, answer is, uh, the answer is I might not have it forever or for very long. But in the short run, um, it is, uh, it's kind of an underrated asset. It doesn't have a very high yield. I understand that. But uh, it has a lot of embedded optionality. If things start to fall apart in other categories, the person with cash is able to kind of come in, pivot uh, with better information into something that's doing well or pick up bargains if some other sector has fallen out of bed. I also um, I recommend private equity, um, art, fine art. Uh, land, real estate. I think these are all assets that um, in, in various ways will hold up to inflation or deflation. And that's an important point because we could have either one. Uh, the stage is set for either one. There are certainly forces in place pushing in both directions. Uh, you know, if you definitely knew inflation was coming, investing would be easy. You'd go buy gold, silver, land. You'd leverage it up. That's easy. If you definitely knew deflation was coming, uh, you'd have cash. You'd have 10-year treasury notes and some other assets that are robust to de deflation. But what if I said we're right on the knife edge? It could tip either way, which I think is uh, the best way to describe the system. So you would want some of both. I call this the, the barbell approach where you have inflation hedges like gold, silver, and land. You have deflation hedges like 10-year treasury notes. And then connecting the two ends of the barbell, you have cash, which gives you um, a lot of embedded optionality. That's a, that's a great point. And, and, and uh, it's an all-around, like a four-season portfolio. Um, I, I want to ask you a few things about it. Um, private equity. The thing I love about that, uh, collectibles, uh, art, obviously collectibles have been one of the best performing uh, um, assets of, of the last five, six years. I mean, uh, you talk about like Ferraris and, and Lamborghinis from the 15th to 60s, they've gone up in insane valuations. Um, and what I also like about that, all of these and real estate is it's off Wall Street. It, it doesn't matter what the financial sector is doing. Uh, these these are uh, uncorrelated assets. Is that is that part of the reason why you you like private equity? Follow following that question regarding cash thirty percent. The reason that you're feeling comfortable with this is because you don't expect something that is going to crater the entire plan overnight. People are going to have time to prepare. If they see inflation start creeping up, they can unload some of that cash into other uh, sort of assets and. Just to clarify, when you say factor of five to ten in gold, you mean five hundred to thousand percent, correct? That's correct. Uh, so I've got gold going to um, uh, well, my tar intermediate target price is ten thousand dollars an ounce. That's not a number uh, you know that I made up or I pull out of a hat or I uh, mention just to get uh, publicity or uh, attract attention. It's actually. Um, the result of a, a careful study of the implied non-deflationary price of gold uh, in a financial panic. If you had a financial crisis worse than 2008, which is what I expect, I think you can see that coming based on the, the system dynamics, the scale of the system, the concentration of banking assets, the amount of derivatives, the interconnectedness of the system. There, there are lots and lots of reasons, and I discuss all this in detail in my book, why the, ne why the next financial crisis will be worse than 2008. So if, if something like that comes along, uh, you're going to need a solution. You're going to need a way to uh, both restore confidence and reliquify the world. Now, we're at the 
point where central banks are tapped out. I mean, they, they took their balance sheets. I'll use the Federal Reserve as an example. They took their balance sheet from $800 billion to over $4 trillion to deal with the last crisis, but they have not normalized it. They haven't gone back down to $800 billion or even a trillion since the crisis is what's, over. They're what's still, the risk in that? What is the risk for them to have such well, a large uh, portfolio? Well, one risk is that um, if you have another crisis tomorrow, what are you going to do? I mean, you're going to double it again to eight trillion, twelve trillion. Where's the where's the confidence boundary? I mean, legally you could, um, and a lot of modern uh, modern monetary theorists, MMT people, uh, you know, Professor Stephanie Kelton, Paul McCulley, and others think that that's exactly what you would do. You would just print more money and take the balance sheet to eight trillion or twelve trillion. I don't think that will work. I think that there's some uh, the you can't specify the exact number, but there's some confidence boundary where people just say, you know what, I'm out of here. I, the system's crazy. I don't, I don't believe you can keep printing. I want to dump my dollars and get into some of these other hard assets. So that's where the price would begin to spike. But there is one other source of liquidity in the world, potentially, which is the special drawing right. That's world money uh, printed by the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Um, it sounds kind of geeky and complicated. That's partly by design because they don't want people to understand it. But simply put, you know, the Federal Reserve can print dollars. The European Central Bank can print euros. Well, the IMF has a printing press. They can print these SDRs. Uh, but unlike the other central banks I mentioned, they're not highly leveraged. The uh, IMF is only leveraged about three to one. World, Jim Rickers. How are you? Where, where am I catching you today, Jim? Uh, I'm upstate, uh, up in New England, up in the mountains, uh, in my one of my studios, and uh, it's very, uh, it's great to be with you, Lior. Um, listen, Jim, I want to get started with, you know, with with what's working in today's market. Um, what are some of the most attractive assets for 2017? Well, you know, Leo, the way I uh, think about it, I have what I call a, a permanent portfolio, which is uh, just a way to allocate wealth. It's what I do uh, with my own money, and I recommend it to investors. Uh, that is robust to uh, just about everything that could happen. I, I'm more of a global macro strategist. I'm not a stock picker. I don't uh, recommend you know buy this sector or that sector uh, in particular. But my permanent portfolio would have um, basically it would, it would be allocations of your investable assets. Now I should define that term. First of all, investable assets is, is the amount of money or savings that you have to invest, not including your home equity and your business equity. I don't think people should treat their homes as uh, a portfolio investment. I know a lot of people do. It's a big expenditure, but it's not something you really want to uh, gamble with or take chances with or over leverage. Uh, same thing with your business equity. If you're, you know, you're a dry cleaner, car dealer, doctor, lawyer, dentist, uh, you run a pizza parlor, restaurant, whatever, uh, that's your livelihood. So you don't want to uh, really speculate with that. So take your home equity and your business equity, put it off to one side, whatever's left over, those are your investable assets. I recommend 10% of that uh, in physical gold uh, or silver. I think silver uh, also performs very much the same function, not 50%, not 100%. You know, you shouldn't go all in on any asset category, but I think uh, 10% is the right amount. Um, I expect a goal to go up uh, by a factor of you know perhaps five to ten um, in a matter of years. I mean, not talking about twenty years, and talking two to three years in in the next global financial panic. That's something I talk about in my books. Uh, uh, my most recent book, The Road to Ruin, and also uh, just coming out this week is the paperback edition, uh, edition of uh, uh, The Death of Money. is a 2014 book. It's just coming out in paperback now with new material. So I talk about I talk about this uh, in uh, in those books, and the point I make is that um, if if nothing bad happens, and let's hope for that, uh, you know, you won't get hurt with a 10% allocation. But if a lot of these other asset categories collapse, that 10% gold and silver is your insurance. I also recommend cash, a large and companies, but not listed companies, not companies on the New York Stock Exchange or, or the Nasdaq, but you know, startup companies, technology companies, natural resource companies created by entrepreneurs, where. Um, you can know the person you're investing with. It, it's still a form of investing. You're, you're buying stock, but you're not relying on a stock exchange or an index uh, or a broker for your liquidity. It's really just a contract between you and the entrepreneur starting the company. I think there are some attractive opportunities there. A little bit hard to identify, but uh, the other one is fine. I'm not necessarily a big fan of what people call collectibles, whether it's wine or Lamborghinis. Uh, fine art, yes. 
uh, but that's because fine art has a very, very long track record, really thousands of years, uh, as being a very good store of wealth. Um, the pro- the problem with the you know Lamborghini, uh, it might go up, the dollar price might go up, but it's not liquid. I mean, <clears throat> try selling it in a in a panic, you won't be able to. Uh, or how we preserve wealth uh, through through thick and thin. So the model portfolio is really gold, silver, land, cash, fine art, and private equity. I'm not saying don't have anything in the stock market, but I would keep that allocation relatively modest. And and most of all, be nimble, stay informed. I mean, this is not – none of these things are set it and forget it portfolios. They're a good place to start. But you, uh, you know, things are changing daily. I think the fact that Trump's election as president is a very significant change in the financial landscape in terms of potential response functions to future panics. So uh, you need to, uh, as I say, stay alert and stay nimble. Um, <clears throat> let, let's break down the biggest risks for the average person. Let, let's separate the, the question into four groups. The retirees, the people that are working but don't have but have insufficient savings right now. Um, and then gr- the third group would be basically people that have uh, that are working and they're in peak earning years, so 35 to 55, 65, and they have market, uh, they have money working in the markets, they have allocations. And the fourth group would be the millennial generation just starting out, getting out of college. Um, what would be the risks to these uh, four groups separately, what, and, and, and more important than risks for for listeners, uh, what are some of the solutions that you're uh, you know suggesting for people who are retiring right now, for people who are in low paying jobs and, and just don't have uh, you know a lot of savings, and then uh, pe- 